Um, this is uh, work which is based on a current book project I'm working on, on the uh, role played by the concept of sense in Deleuze's philosophy. Um, like all of the papers I give, I'm never sure if it will make any sense, even though it's a paper, part of a project about sense. But here we'll go. So I will begin today, uh, I'd like to begin this paper today, by laying out a scenario that illustrates the key distinctions I want to elaborate. The scenario is offered by Nietzsche in his genealogical account of the origins of noble and slave morality. We can understand this account in terms of what Deleuze calls an encounter or event. This event encounter involves a clash of forces that differ in strength and weakness, which Nietzsche distinguishes using the titles noble and slave. It gives rise to a problem of moral interpretation or judgment that concerns the meaning or the sense of the encounter itself. This problem is fully real and, a, and an objective problem. It is not simply uh, something contrived in the heads of the antagonists. But as a problem, it presents nothing more than a vague and indistinct or undifferentiated plurality. That is to say, the problem posed by this clash is not how to fit the event under some pre-existing moral category in order to decide what it is, because no such set of distinct and opposed categories has yet come into being, and thus no judgment can as yet be passed on in this way. In the problem presented by the clash, then, the encounter can mean, and indeed does mean, anything and everything and nothing at all. We always begin thinking, Deleuze says, when we encounter something that we can, cannot recognize but only sense, something for which our concepts and categories are inadequate. The realization of some set of distinct and opposed categories is a task of thinking, and its effect is to offer a solution to the problem the encounter poses. And of course, this problem in this respect can be solved in many ways. Nietzsche in the first essay of the genealogy shows us two such forms, good and bad and good and evil. But he never says that these are the only two possibilities. So there is an encounter, a problem of how meaningful distinctions are to be cut out of a vague plurality of existing but unrealized meanings and various realizable ways of cutting and solving the problem. However, for the divisions given by any solution to have the actuality that can allow them to be used and uh, to judge the encounter and to judge anything else once these divisions are formed that falls within its remit, the division needs to be anchored in something. The answers, after all, cannot be meaningful unless they are meaningful for some subject who can receive and employ them. And no answer can escape the possibility of simply being senseless to some subject or another. For Nietzsche, this something that anchors each answer is the will to power of the nobles and the slaves. Here again, we can follow Deleuze in saying that each of these wills to power incarnates one of the moralities literally making it flesh and blood. The nobles incarnate the morality of good and bad. The slaves incarnate that of good and evil. They make these moralities live. Yet it is not as nobles and slaves, as real individuals, that achieves this incarnation, assuming we want to say that Nietzsche is referring to real individuals in the first place, but it's rather as perspectives of appraisal. It's from the height of the pathos of distance, Nietzsche says, that the nobles first seize the right to create values of good and bad. It's from the lowly perspective of the slaves, who are like sheep looking up at the great birds of prey that carry off and consume them, that the morality of good and evil is born. Nobles and slaves each have the morality that they ought to have given their positions as dominant or weak. These positions are the result of their clash and they inframe the way each necessarily appraises their distinct moral worlds. Now, the point I want to make in setting all of this out is that the process by which the good, bad, and good, evil distinctions are consolidated and given definition, and the process by which the noble and slaves' perspective, perspectives that incarnate them are formed, are irreducibly different. One is a differentiation of the multiplicity of indistinct or vanishingly small differences that constitute the virtual problem, that constitute a virtual problem where this differentiation unfolds these differences and moves them from a state where the law of, non, of contradiction does not apply to another in which it does. The other is the essential process of intensity that seems to disappear in the process of unfolding and expressing itself. 
These distinct processes, of course, are what Deleuze refers to as the actualization of the virtual and intensity's process of individuation. Now what follows, I will examine this distinction, which Deleuze inaugurates in difference and repetition, between the virtual and its actualization on the one side, and intensity and its process of individuation or incarnation on the other side, by tying it back to the discussion of force and will to power in Nietzsche and philosophy. I will then explore how this distinction is further developed in terms of distinct processes of actualization versus effectuation in the logic of sense. The difference between the virtual and intensity has become a subject of increasing discussion among Deleuze scholars in recent years. However, as with many such discussions, it is hampered, I believe, by the still prominent doxa that since the late 1990s has considered Bergson to be Deleuze's chief philosophical inspiration, his master, as Badiou called Bergson in Deleuze the Clamor of Being, which was a position also taken up at the time by Keith Ansel Pearson in Germinal Life and by many others at the time and since then. The consequence of this doxa has been that the virtual actual is treated as the real center of Deleuze's thought and thus the way of, to understand most, if not all of his other key concepts. In this regard, this paper might be seen as yet another attempt in my seemingly unend unending personal crusade to get people to stop seeing Bergson and quite, as being quite so crucial to Deleuze's thought. Now it is notable in the 1966 work Bergsonism that Deleuze not only refers to a single process that actualizes and incarnates the virtual, but at several points in the text treats actualization and incarnation as interchangeable. There are, for example, four occasions in the text where Deleuze writes about a process to quote, actualize or incarnate. And the French verb incarné is in the English, uh, trans uh, English translation rendered as embody, but it's actualize or embody or actualize or incarnate. Moreover, in one of his few uses of effectuation in the text, he equates it with actualization, writing, quote, in the case of subjective duration, the divisions are valid only, are only valid insofar as they are effectuated, that is, actualized. Finally, Deleuze carrying forward a claim made in his 1956 essay, Bergson's Conception of Difference, argues, noticeably without any textual evidence, that Bergson himself brings the virtual and intensity together by conceiving of intensive quantity through a concept of virtual number. Now, within a few years of all this, however, Deleuze will draw careful distinctions between these terms and processes, and he will do so, I contend, in a way that circumscribes and limits the role played by the virtual and actual in Deleuze's rethinking of identity, difference, time, sense, and becoming. Ultimately, as I hope to make clear, what the virtual's actualization does for Deleuze is ground the categories of representation, while intensity and individuation on the one hand serve as the means to accomplish this grounding, and on the other hand, drive an ungrounding of representation, thought, and change. This development, as I say, can be traced to the distinction Deleuze draws in Nietzschean philosophy between force and will to power, where he holds that these two concepts uh, are inseparable, but not for that reason identical, and where he says, quote, force is what can, will to power is what wills. And the distinction then, as I say, develops from in further indifference and repetition, and then beyond that in the logic of sense. Those are the three texts I'll focus on. However, before turning to the three texts, themselves, I want to briefly consider the relationship between intensity and quantity in Deleuze's work. These, the points I'll make here are familiar to any of you who know Mary Beth Mader's work on these topics. Now for Aristotle, the idea of more or less pertains to qual quality, but not to quantity. We can have more or less redness, more or less light and so forth, but we cannot have more or less two-ness or three-ness. These qualitative variations are variations of intensity, and they are not quantifiable for Aristotle because he sees quantity pertaining only to things that can be divided into discrete and continue or continuous parts and can then be counted or measured. If quantity applies to qualitative variations, Aristotle says, it is only insofar as they exist in quantifiable things. So for example, red and hearing in a subject that's divisible into countable or measurable parts. In the medieval period, uh, we see attempts to consider this qualitative variation in quantitative terms by way of a notion of intensive quantity applicable to things that are not divided into parts. 
Duns Scotus is a key figure in this movement, particularly by way of his conception of modal distinction. For Duns Scotus, the distinction between Socrates' finite wisdom and God's infinite wisdom is a difference of degree, where the two wisdoms remain univocal because the variation does not divide them into distinct species or types. On the, on the one side, this way of thinking leads to a notion of intensive magnitude or quantity as a measurable difference in degree. A common example of this would be the relation between two temperatures. That Deleuze is not really interested in this kind of intensive quantity can be seen, for example, in his discussion of Bergsonism, in his discussion in Bergsonism, sorry, about degrees of difference versus differences of degree, where the former is the quantity that belongs to the virtual. On the other side, however, it leads to a general notion of quantity pertaining to anything subject to increase or diminution, to more or less, separate from any question of how much. This more or less but not how much is precisely the notion of intensive quantity that Bergson considers a contradiction in terms in time and free will, where he argues that if we say one thing differs by more or less than another, we must naturally ask by how much. It is nevertheless becomes the mathematical definition of quantity referenced by Hegel in his discussion of quantity in general, drawn on by Riemann in his considerations of the foundations of geometry, and it is a definition Deleuze himself often deploys. However, in Deleuze's understanding of intensive quantity, although the, a notion of degree applies to it, it is not a degree as a unit of scale of measurement, so it's not like 37 degrees Celsius. It is rather what Nietzsche calls an order of rank, here we can note the archaic meaning of degree in both English and French refers to social rank. Intensive quantities are degrees or ranks and thus entail a hierarchy, but one based on imminent principles that vary with context rather than some fixed scale of values. Pace Deleuze's discussion of the two types of hierarchy in his Nietzsche book. Now in Nietzschean philosophy, Deleuze holds that the pluralist concept of force follows necessarily after the substantive concepts of thing and object are shown to be incapable of accounting for plurality, the plurality, distance, and relation required of them. A force that could not affect another would not be a force at all. It would be impotent. And so every force is, quote, essentially related to another force, unquote, meaning that every force is defined by its difference from other forces. This is a quantitative difference. As Deleuze writes, difference in quantity is the essence of force and of the relation of force to force, unquote. But this is a difference that cannot be equalized. It is a difference of more or less, but not how much, as any measurement by way of an external scale would leave the determination of forces, quote, abstract, incomplete, and ambiguous. Forces also have a quality related to the difference in quantity that defines them. This quality arises because intensive quantitative difference cannot be equalized, which entails that while each force is what it is by virtue of its relation to other forces, the very irreducibility of these relations also makes each force qualitatively distinct. In quantitative terms, differing forces are strong or weak, while in qualitative terms, they are active or reactive. If I can be permitted to employ some dialectical language in the discussion of Deleuze, we can say that a force's quantitative difference speaks to what it is in its being for others, while its quality speaks to what it is in its being for itself. Nevertheless, Deleuze contends, these forces, defined only by their imminent relations, quote, would remain indeterminate unless an element which is capable of determining them from a double point of view is added to force, unquote. This element is the will to power, which determines forces in terms of both the reciprocal genesis of their difference in quantity and the absolute genesis of their distinct qualities. The will to power is the in itself of forces that are what they are for others and for themselves only through their relations. Now invoking this in itself with its implication of something pure and, un and related only to itself might seem to undermine the entire metaphysics of force. But Nietzsche holds that it follows from mechanism's own, quote, victorious concept of force. A force's power is at the same time its capacity to be affected, but this affectivity is lacking from the mechanistic account. As Nietzsche himself states, the will to power must therefore be introduced because, quote, 
mere variations of power could not feel themselves to be such. There must be present something that wants to grow and interprets the value of whatever else wants to grow. Now, importantly, Nietzsche adds uh, that with respect to the present, to this presence of something that seeks to grow, these different powers are, quote, equal in that. In other words, there is a univocid city and equivalence among forces in their internal drive to discharge themselves. The will to power therefore expresses an intensity of force that is distinct from the relationality that defines force's essence. No force could be or become without an inner compulsion to discharge itself against resistances. This compulsion provides the final determination of forces, but in a very precise way. It is by virtue of the will to power that clashing forces are determined, not in their strength and weakness, nor in their activity or reactivity, but in terms of their individuatedness. It is the will to power that individuates forces, not in the sense of making them unique or one of a kind, and as Deleuze maintains, individuation does not constitute the simple individual, but in terms of establishing the multiple senses of their struggle with other forces, and thus the multiple senses of their, of their becoming, so that the individual is always a multiple singularity. Now, Deleuze deploys, employs the same language of double determination and difference in repetition to present intensity as an irreducible supplement needed to account for the actualization of virtual ideas. In chapter three of the text, Deleuze challenges the dogmatic image that conceives thought in terms of a model of recognition, where thinking means recognizing an object and submitting it to categories of representation. Against this, he asserts that thinking only begins when we are forced into it through an encounter with the intensive, which resides within the sensible as something unrecognizable, unrepresentable, and thus unknowable, so that any categories that might be brought to bear on this intensity still need to be created. This creation comes by way of the, by the way the encounter engenders ideas, which are not really my ideas because they relate to a spontaneity of thought that occurs within me, but which I do not author. Kant holds ideas to be pure concepts of reason that determine how understanding is employed to deal with experience in its totality, maintaining that since they provide systematicity to thinking but cannot be given to us as an object of possible experience, they remain a problem for which there is no solution. Kant nevertheless also presents an idea whose mere thought engenders its solution when discussing the comprehensive structure produced by the idea of philosophy in the penultimate chapter of the first critique, the architectonic of pure reason, which is perhaps where the real connections between Kantian ideas and Deleuzean ideas is to be found, but that's the subject for another paper. Deleuze adopts and adapts this Kantian understanding, arguing that ideas are problematic structures that are capable of solution, but that do not disappear when so resolved. He further argues against Kant that ideas are not simply regulative, regulative of how we understand reality, but are rather constitutive and that they account for a triple genesis of the qualities that allow real objects to be distinguished, of the time and space that serve as conditions of knowledge, and of the concepts that allow knowledge to come into being. What ideas generate, however, is not the reality of these objects as such, but those aspects that allow them to make sense. Deleuzean ideas thereby eschew the epistemological question, what is X, instead concern questions of who, how much, in what cases, and so on. Deleuze holds ideas to be differential structures involving elements that are indeterminate in themselves, but that become determinable in reciprocal relations to one another, and for which a complete determination is possible. He illustrates these points through a the differential in calculus holding that dx and dy are indeterminate in themselves, since as infinitesimals they are nothing more than indefinitely small magnitudes, but that they are reciprocally determinable in relation to each other in the form of dy over dx, and are completely determined when specific values are yielded for the differential equation. Like Nietzschean forces, these differences are determined only in relation to other differences. Ideas have a tripartite principle of sufficient reason that relates to and expresses pure elements of quantitability, qualitability, and potentiality or power. Ideas are virtual insofar as they are determined by ways of vanishingly small differences, 
there are no discernibly separate and opposed components of a virtual idea. Its differences are instead indistinct, or I'm sorry, distinct, sorry, but obscure. And hence the law of contradiction, the law that this is this and not that, does not apply. Separations instead arise with an idea's actualization, which solves its problematic structure by differentiating its vanishing differences into qualitatively distinct species, quantifiably extensive parts. The idea's qualitability and quantitability are thereby unfolded. Now you might think that once one has sorted out the categories under which things or events can be classified and the ways they can be divided, if you have an idea that's actualized basically, you will have a pretty complete sense of what the things the, the ideas apply to are, what those things and events are. But Deleuze insists that the idea actualized into species and parts remains vague and incomplete that all that has been engendered are abstract generalities of quantity and quality. These, he says, must still be determined from a double point of view by an additional element that dramatizes the idea by way of spatiotemporal dynamisms, he says, that lie beneath actualized species and parts. Now, again, returning to Kant, the dynamic involves a synthesis of heterogeneities and refers not to an object's appearance, but to its relations to other objects and the modalities of its existence. For Deleuze, these relations and modalities are not merely regulative, as they are for Kant, but constitutive, and they realize the idea in a completely different way than its actualization into general species and parts. If we refer, refer back to the moral problematic from which the solutions of good, bad, and good, evil are said to emerge, we can say that while, they pro while we can provide general accounts of, say, good and evil, through notions such as intentional harm, selflessness, sacrifice, and so forth. These remain little more than meaningless cliches unless we can anchor them in figures who enact them, unless we can make reference to heroes and villains, to characters that in their relations to one another and in their ways of being, illustrate concretely, and illustrate concretely what it is to be sel a selfish or self-sacrificing person and who thus stretch out the field of answers to the questions who, which one, how, etc. This is how Nietzsche's nobles and slaves dramatize their moralities. Dramatization, Deleuze says, is a differentiation of the differentiation of differences, differentiation of virtual differences. Now it is here that intensity is introduced. If actualization remains indeterminate without dramatization, the latter finds its ground in individuation, which is the essential process of intensity. Deleuze holds intensity to be the in itself of difference, expressing how difference is implicated, is first implicated always in itself, always incorporating the unequal into itself, independently of its relations to others, and thus before it is implicated and explicated in such relations to others. Intensity is inseparable from the idea's differential structure, but it resides within it as something different. Intensity, we could say, is included in the idea but cannot be accounted for by the idea. It is the ideas and therefore thoughts imminent outside. Ideas are engendered by an encounter with intensity, which Deleuze also calls the reason of the sensible, that by which the given is given. In this respect, Deleuze's intensity parallels Kant's claim that an object uh, given to experience a priori displays an intensive degree of, of reality. But as already discussed for Deleuze, degree, uh, for Deleuze, degree is not a unit on a fixed scale, but an order of rank. Thus, while we can speak of differences of intensity, this statement is tautological because intensity is difference. What is given may in some respect be more or less intense, but all givens are equal in being intensive. Just as for Nietzsche, forces may be stronger or weaker, but they are equal in the intensity of their wills to power. The nobles and slaves are equal in their wills to power. It's not that the nobles have a stronger will to power than the slaves, etc., even if the nobles are stronger than the slaves. What then is intensity's essential process of individuation? Deleuze states that, quote, the individuating is not the simple individual, and that it is not an, it cannot be seen as an extension or completion as actualization. That is, individuation is not some analogous form of determination that takes us from the species level to the individual level. Instead, and in line with the idea of the dynamic as a synthesis of heterogeneities, 
Deleuze proposes that individuation is a synthesis of the disparate, that is, of what cannot be compared, what has no commonality and is therefore different in kind. As a synthesis of this dis differ, uh, disparate, by way of a difference in itself or a difference that differs in the first instance from itself and that therefore has no identity. This intensive difference in itself serves as a connector without establishing an identity between what it connects. It acts as a sign signal that flashes across the intensive, which is to say unextended interval between, these, the, between the disparates it brings together. Now we can expound on this process by drawing on difference and repetitions discussion of Leibnizian incompossibility. It's important to note here that Deleuze distinguishes incompossibility from vice diction, holding that while compossibility is an analytic extension of vice diction that for Leibniz reconciles discreteness and continuity of the world, incompossibility implies only difference, that is, implies only divergence. And I mean, the side point of that is that vice diction is not as important as incompossibility because vice diction is what unifies uh, uh, unifies by convergence a single world. It's, it's incompossibility that links together divergent worlds that relates to their di the disjunction of, of divergent worlds. The virtual idea forms, in this respect, the virtual idea forms a structure of vice dicting differences while individuation is a synthesis of incompossibles. For Leibniz, there's no essential difference between Adam the sinner and Adam the non-sinner but rather an incompossibility of the worlds in which each exists. It is logically possible for Adam not to sin, but the non-sinning Adam implies a world wholly incompatible with our own. This makes Adam a figure without identity and crosses between and connects these two worlds, but also a difference that is once the smallest and the most absolute. Because the atoms of the two worlds are indiscernible, there is no essential difference between them, and yet they are completely different. The smallest difference between them is at the same time the greatest chasm. Deleuze adds to this picture by insisting against Leibniz that incompossible, incompossibles belong to the same world. So that rather than there being one world where Adam sins and another where he doesn't sin, there's a single world where it's undecidable whether Adam sins or doesn't sin, or where he both sins and doesn't sin, because it depends on one's point of view. In this perspectival world, which is for Deleuze our world, Adam is not a definite individual who might be determined as a sinner or non-sinner, but is instead an intensity that links to, uh, these disparate realities together within this one world. The figure of Adam anchors the actualization of these various realities by way of a multiple dramatization, so that he becomes at once the first sinner, the first fall guy, a hero, a tragic figure, and so forth. This is why Adam cannot be a simple determined individual in the first place. What this leaves us with is that there are many perspectives on Adam, Deleuze argues, but Adam also incarnates or embodies a perspective on the world, expressing clearly and distinctly a region of the totality of disparate relations, and also expressing confusedly the whole itself. Intensity constitutes individuality in the sense that no two perspectives are the same. It's in this way that Adam can concretely anchor various actualizations of the, of the virtual because he is a, a particular, a, an individual perspective. Individuation dramatizes the idea in such a way as to that it ensures the idea is always actualized in multiple and irreducible ways. And intensity is what ramifies the series it brings into communication. That's its mode of repetition. There are many actual solutions to, the pro to a problem. And they are all engaged in a struggle for dominance, again in line with Nietzsche's account of the will to power as the drive to interpret and impose its interpretations on the world. We're up to the last main point, by the way, which is the logic of sense. In relation to difference and repetition, the most obvious development taken up by the logic of sense is the shift to the surface. Deleuze himself noting in the preface to the Italian translation of the later text that the concepts remain the same as the earlier work, but they're reorganized according to this surface dimension. This portrayal, however, masks the fact that while the logic of sense is centrally concerned with intensities of the surface, it actually shows almost no interest in the virtual and its actualization. This absence has often gone unnoticed, 
perhaps as a result of the commonly held view that the logic of sense merely carries forward theses developed in difference and repetition. But in Anglophone scholarship, at least, it seems almost certainly also to be a result of confusions encouraged by the English translation of the logic of sense, which consistently renders the French effectuation and contre-effectuation as actualization and counter-actualization, erroneously insinuating a predominance of the same concept that Deleuze and difference and repetition in Bergsonism um, calls actual, actualization. Actualization. Sorry, my, I'm, I, I plead being an American for how badly I, I can pronounce French and, and German and other languages. Uh, sorry, where was I? Okay. Elsewhere, um, sorry, the problematic rendering of, of effectuation as actualization even appears in places where Deleuze uses effectuation alongside actualization, with both words sometimes being translated as actualization in those instances. Elsewhere, the translation distinguishes actualization from effectuation by rendering the latter as realization, which adds further confusions in as much as Deleuze holds that the virtual and actual are both real. Now, effectuation concerns the donation of sense as it applies to designated states of affairs, signifying concepts, and the expressiveness of the speaking subject, the three um, dimensions of the proposition, designation, manifestation, signification. Sense emerges when incorporeal events that are the effects of corporeal bodies and in their interactions are able to free themselves from these bodies in order to, be, to express a becoming that is pure and indifferent to the corporeal actions and passions from which they emerge. A scalpel penetrates a body, but the meaningfulness of this reality is not found in the interaction of the metal and the flesh themselves, but rather insofar as this singular happening relating to other singular happenings can give rise to an impersonal and pre-individual event of cutting to which the scalpel and body can then be placed in proximity. In the same way, it is a proximity to a pure event, a pure impersonal pre-individual event of greening that a tree can be said to become, to be or become more or less green in proximity to an event of sinning that Adam is judged to sin or not sin and in proximity to an event of thinking that one can declare, I think. What characterizes these pure events is the bivalence of their sense. They express a becoming in two directions at once. The growth to adulthood is simultaneously the decay and dissolution of childhood. So the change is paradoxically both growth and decay at the same time. It only takes on a unidirectional character with the insertion of some end or telos that imposes itself from outside onto the process. Hence, Deleuze says this becoming is best expressed by the infinite form of verbs, not cutting, but to cut, which is indifferent to the subject or the object of cutting, as well as the positive or negative judgment that cutting is happening. The bivalence, now the bivalence and purity of, of events, oh, sorry, the bivalence and purity of its events make sense neutral in relation to bodies and states of affairs. Sense is neither active nor passive, Deleuze says, but impassive, it is not of the nature to act or be acted upon. But Deleuze also insists that sense has a power to produce something in these states of affairs. While only corporeal interactions can produce incorporeal sense, only sense can individuate bodies in their mixtures. Effectuation individuates and incarnates sense in the bodies that engender it. It is therefore not an actualization. It follows from the way events only become independent from bodies and states of affairs through their relations to one another. Now events are singular, and so they have no necessary connection between them, which means that their relations are external and their organization comes from the outside. For Deleuze, this organization involves events communicating by way of a paradoxical um, or nonsense event with a capital E that does not simply become in two directions at once, but immediately differs from itself. The capital E event is an intensity that engenders the thinking necessary to organize the surface of events or organize events into a surface. The principles that organize the surface are Leibnizian. In addition to establishing ideational verb events, the organization of the surface also carries out a static, ontological, and logical genesis. The first, 
of these effectuates individuals and persons from this impersonal, pre-individual field. Individuals engender a world defined on the basis of vice diction and convergence, with the individual being a monad that envelops and expresses the totality of this world, but that envelops and expresses clearly and distinctly only a local region of it. Persons are signs flashing across and connecting incompossible worlds. A person, to lose rights, is, quote, objectively indeterminate, a, quote, vagabond or nomad that holds good for many of these worlds or, in the last analysis, for all worlds, despite their divergences and the individuals which inhabit them. Individuals and persons bear predicates that are absolutely singular, not, not generalizable. A tree has this individual color. It's this individual green. There's nothing more general about having color than being green. Disparate atoms reside in a multiplicity of gardens, but each is always this singular garden. Singular predicates nevertheless provide the logical possibilities for propositions that using effectuated individuals and persons as material instances provide solutions to the problematic surface of events and bring them to bear on objects and states of affairs. Now, Deleuze here offers the example of the battle as an impassive capital E event that hovers over a state of affairs, but is also effectuated and incarnated in the associated bodies of this state of affairs. The battle and its associated pure events of killing, dying, wounding, fleeing, etc., is nowhere to be found as such, but it is nevertheless incarnated in the disparate realities of the soldier who fires his weapon, the one who flees from danger, the one who lies mortally wounded, and so on. Nothing, there's nothing common to these lived experiences except the problematic of battle that animates them. And though the structure of sense and its effect, and, and through the structure of sense and its effectuations, these diverse experiences are given meaning. But the same structure also provides the basis for a counter effectuation that releases the event from any particular sense and meaning that its effectuation or incarnation entails returning it to a state of impassiveness where it communicates with all other vice-dicting and incompossible events and realities. Counter-effectuation is a matter of affirming difference and divergence, and for Deleuze, this is an ethical affirmation. He cites Joe Bousquet, a soldier par paralyzed in the Great War whose injury becomes a starting point for a body of poetic work, which, quote, is in its entirety a meditation on the wound, the event, and language, unquote. The meditation concerns the possibility for amor fati, a love of fate without resentment. This is in no way a matter of transforming a catastrophic injury into a happy and cheery occasion, nor is it a matter of being resigned in the face of it, but it's about releasing the self from resentment and ill will that comes from a moral condemnation of the world that allows such events to happen to us. Deleuze writes that it presents, quote, a volitional intuition and a transmutation. There, there was about a million more things to say about effectuation and counter-effectuation, but for time reasons, I, I wasn't uh, going to, to talk about it. But we can do that maybe in the in the discussion. But I'm up to the to the final points. So we're almost at the end. What then is actualization in all of this analysis in the logic of sense? The few points where the term appears make it clear: impersonal and pre-individual singularities. Quote preside over the genesis of individuals and persons. These singularities, quote, are distributed in a potential which admits neither self nor I, unquote, but this potential, quote, produces them, that is self and I, by actualizing or effectuating itself. However, and this is the last quote from, from this section of the logic of sense, the figures of this actualization, that is the self and the I, do not resemble the effectuated potential, that is individuals and persons. Unquote. Now, as both difference and repetition in the logic of sense discuss, I and self are components of a structure of the other, that being autri rather than autre, the structure of the other that papers over centers of individuation by explicating their intensities. This structure other, Deleuze explains in the fourth appendix, appendix of the logic of sense, gives rise to, quote, an entire field of virtualities and potentialities which I already know, knew were capable of being actualized. 
and it renders possible the constitution of a series of dualistic categories on which the perceptual field functions. In short, basically, the actualization of the virtual grounds the world of representation. It creates the binary categories, the dualistic categories upon which perception functions. Effectuation, on the other hand, is wrapped up with the process, is wrapped up with the process of actualization, but that's because actualization has to be accomplished, that is effectuated. The differentiation has to be differentiated, which is the way Deleuze puts it in difference or repetition. But effectuation is also, by way of counter-effectuation, the way representation is ungrounded and dissolved. And this is why, as the, tape, the, paper, the title of this paper indicates, I think we should forget about the virtual because what matters is intensity. It's not that the virtual and its actualization are not important components to Deleuze's thought, but his aim, as I hope to have shown, is to get us beyond them by showing that really what it's a matter of is effectuation and intensity that grounds actualization, but also ungrounds it. So that's the wrap up of the paper. I just sort of brought it to an end.